Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Anya Gorman, and I work for the Stop Climate Chaos Coalition. Hopefully, everyone can hear me with my Britney Spears mic on. Um, you're very welcome. What we're going to be talking about today is what is this 7% number of emissions reduction that's been flying around the news in the last few days. We have some great guests here to share with us their expertise around what this number is and loads of other things about emissions reduction in Ireland. And um, before I introduce our guests, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. So Zoom housekeeping, this is a webinar. Uh, you might have been on call, a call before, a Zoom call before, and usually you can see every single participant. Because we have almost 350 people registered for this call, it would be totally overwhelming to have 350 faces and to figure out who was speaking at what time. So uh, this format means that you will only see the people who are speaking, so you'll only see our panelists. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't use the chat box. So please, please feel free to use the chat box. It's been nice to see people sharing today what has made them smile, like the sunshine. People uh, have seen foxes. Someone beat their um, child in table tennis. Congratulations. Um, so please, please do use that chat box to talk to each other, to respond. Please try and be compassionate, caring um, with each other. If you want to ask questions after our panelists have spoken, um, I'm gonna ask you to use the Q&A box. So if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a question and answers, it says Q&A, and you can input questions there. Uh, that is the place where we will be taking questions for the Q&A. You can ask them as the uh, panelists are speaking, and we will um, take questions from there and ask our panelists towards the end. We won't be able to take questions from the chat box because it'll be too many and we don't want to lose any. So, um, yeah, so what is, what is this number 7%? Uh, what does it actually mean? Where does it come from? It, over the last few months, we have been talking about the concept of faster and fairer climate action. What is faster? What is fairer? Does 7% fit in there? All these questions will hopefully be answered um, and hopefully many more. In a moment, I'm going to hand over to um, the Stop Climate Chaos Policy Advisor, Saiv O'Neill, who's going to interview, um, give us a brief overview of, of our thinking on this. Um, and then she is going to be interviewing um, Emirates Professor John Sweeney, who is uh, from Maynooth University, and Dr. Carol Augustenberg from UCD. Um, so yeah, hopefully we will have time at the end for a quick action um, and we'll have time for questions and answers. I think that's everything from me for now. Just a reminder to put the questions and questions that you want to ask in the Q&A box, not in the chat. Um, and Kate here is going to be helping me answer questions um, and moderate the chat as well. So thanks for that, Kate. All right, I'm going to hand over to Sive. Thanks very much, Anya, and a big welcome to everybody. It's so exciting to see so many people joining us this evening. We've seen a steady growth in interest uh, amongst our, our own supporters and members over the last few weeks in our webinars, but today surpasses all of our expectations. So welcome to everybody. Uh, we're very conscious that there are people joining us this evening who have maybe more or less knowledge and background of what's actually going on in the political world at the moment with various negotiations and discussions about climate policy. So we're going to try to keep everybody uh, uh, up to date on a level playing field and keep it as simple and straightforward as possible. So just to kick things off, I'm going to explain where I suppose the motivation for this webinar came from. We have been lobbying and working over the last few months in advance of the general election to try to get faster and fairer climate action on the political agenda. Firstly, in the context of the general election campaign, um, myself, uh, John Sweeney and Cara Augustenberg, all here, we would have looked at the manifestos of the political parties prior to the general election and tried to evaluate them all against what we were looking for and what we thought would uh, demonstrate significant uh, commitment and ambition to climate action, which we know 
is one of the most urgent, if not the most urgent uh, crisis facing us uh, today. And even though the public health crisis has understandably garnered all the public attention, it, it's, it's so dramatic and it's, you know, uh, such a life-threatening situation for so, so many of us. Um, nonetheless, the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis are still unfolding in the background. And even though emissions might have dropped um, by the time we come to measure them at the end of the year, um, as a result of everybody not driving and commuting and uh, factories being closed and what have you. Nonetheless, it is expected that 2020 will be the warmest or one of the warmest years on record. And we should be um, very exercised about this and we should be putting all of our energies into ensuring that the next government, no matter what its composition, is taking the scientific uh, advice on the urgency of climate change as seriously as possible and embedding that at the heart of any program for government. So in the context of, of all of this work, uh, and obviously the, the COVID crisis came along <coughs> and government formation talks have been somewhat delayed and very slow. We're now in a situation where the two big parties or two of the three big parties are in a kind of a courtship dance with uh, the Green Party and possibly some groups of smaller, smaller groups of independents. And from the response that we saw published there in the last couple of days to some questions uh, from the Green Party, it appears that there is a very significant shift happening in the positions of Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael. Heretofore, they had been, um, I suppose, much less ambitious on climate policy than some of the other parties. Um, but it's very encouraging to see that they are willing to uh, tease out the implications of a 7% uh, emission reduction target uh, in the context of government formation. Now, what that means, we're going to discuss in practice. But I should say that the uh, objectives of the One Future campaign, which is this coalition of lots of different organizations across civil society, was to seek not just a, a more ambitious climate policy with more steep emission reductions, but also strengthened climate legislation, a commitment to a just transition, an end to fossil fuel infrastructure, such as LNG terminals, and a commitment to acting on uh, the biodiversity crisis, including the establishment of a new citizens' assembly uh, to look at biodiversity. So uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of meat in that um, response from Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, and it's very encouraging to see that finally these issues have reached the very top of the political agenda. So with that as a little kind of introduction, then the next thing we need to do as activists, as engaged citizens, as members of the public, or maybe we're members of organizations, maybe we're members of political parties, is to, I suppose, think about what we do next to advance this. How do we make sure that these conversations turn into meaningful commitments in a program for government? And what will these emission reductions look like in practice? So that's the context in which we sought to invite John and Cara to join us this evening to kind of tease these things out in the form of a conversation because it's, there's not one pathway to net zero emissions. There are many possible pathways to that, and we need the input and advice of as many experts as possible to help us design the fairest way to get there. So I might uh, ask John to come in now, because I know John has some slides to show us. Uh, John has been a tremendous, you work away with the slide sharing there, and I'll just keep chatting for a second okay. to introduce you and say nice things about you. Um, John has been an incredible ally of the environmental and climate movement for the past couple of decades, as well as being a foremost climate scientist who's published extensively about climate change and has contributed to the IPCC reports. He's also uh, been a delegate on the um, Irish delegation, a member of the Irish delegation to the uh, uh, conferences that have been held by the UNFCCC over the years and is very familiar with the international process, the political process, as well as the um, scientific background. So are you ready to go with your Yes, slides? I am. Yeah, Super I deep. think so. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, um, I don't know. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. No, am I, am I muted? 
No, you're perfect. We I'm can okay. Yeah. yeah, thanks very much. Well, thanks very much for, for asking me to talk to you. And, and um, I'm not used to talking to a blank screen with 300 people behind it. So uh, it's quite intimidating. But um, as Saif was saying, you know, the, the figures that are being bandied around at the moment um, may to some people have come out of the blue, um, but in fact they have been figures which have uh, a logic behind them. <laughs> and the first logic is the logic of the, the Paris Agreement itself, which um, uh, many of the people I think around today might even have been at in 2015. Um, <clears throat> Article 2 of the agreement there is, is what underpins everything we're doing in climate at the moment, uh, which the treaty, and it's a treaty, says we have to hold the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees. And that's the, the key phrase there, the pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. And that's where that 7% has come from because each year before the Conference of the Parties UN meeting, um, the United Nations publish a gap report which says how far are we away from the necessary pathway to achieving that. And at the most recent one in Madrid, um, the Secretary General um, Antonio Guterres um, indicated that unless global greenhouse gas emissions were to fall by 7.6% each year for the next 10 years, then that 1.5 degree target would be elusive. And if that target is elusive, then we, we face problems down the road. And in particular, um, what he said was, well, um, the impact on the planet could be catastrophic if we don't achieve a, a, a reduction of about 7.6%. Now, where does the 7% come from from that? Well, firstly, 7.6% is the global figure. And of course, uh, a developed and a fairly rich country like Ireland would be expected under uh, a principle called the common but differentiated responsibility principle, they would be expected to do more because some countries have contributed to the problem for a long time. Um, and some countries have better resources to tackle the problem. So that figure of 7.6% is a global figure uh, and of course the developed country as I say would be expected to do more. Why it's important? It's important because it comes originally from the IPCC reports, the, the gold standard if you like of climate science which indicated in its last report that we had to achieve carbon neutral status uh, as a as a globe by around the middle of this century to avoid that 1.5 degree value. And to do that, we needed to be reducing emissions in the short term quite radically. Now, there's a bit of a difference between some of their figures and some of uh, the figures you're reading about. Some of them don't include other gases like methane. Some of them start from slightly different starting points. But essentially, um, it's the direction of travel that's important here. And really, we have to be on a pathway to achieve that zero, um, net zero figure by 2050. So that's why it's important. But you're probably saying to yourself, so what? Um, uh, why do we pick that? And here I think is the key uh, scientific thing behind it because if you look at that little grey band in the middle of your screen, that's the range between 1.5 and 2 degrees of warming. And on the left you can see from these kind of burning ember diagrams the, the way in which some tipping points are triggered at or very even below that value. And by tipping points, I mean things that we might not be able to stop, even if we were to become really good in the next uh, half century or so. And among them, you can see the, uh, the, the beginnings of the melt out of the West Atlantic, West, West Antarctic ice sheet, the beginning of the uh, irrevocable melting out of Greenland, it'll take centuries, the loss of the summer sea ice, the loss of the Alpine glaciers, the loss of the coral reefs, and of course, the coral reefs will be the first to go. Uh, if you've got kids wanting to see the Great Barrier Reef, bring them now because it will be gone in 20 years time. Um, so uh, it's already showing acute signs of difficulty. And of course, were we not even to tackle uh, the, the range of the 1.5 to 2 degrees, we would face even greater problems down the road. Now, that's important for, you might think, 
the tropical world, but it's also important for places like Ireland because what we're seeing with that warming of the planet uh, is a wob uh, an increased tendency for wobbling of the jet stream. And the reasons for that relate to the changes that are taking place in the Arctic in particular. So we're getting more irregular weather. We're getting more extremes. We're getting more of the kind of stuff we had this winter in February uh, with the horrible scenes of flooding. We're going to see more heat waves in, in Europe. We're going to see more flooding in Ireland. We're going to see more drought in the summer. All of these things are are likely to become more frequent and indeed some of them are already becoming more frequent than they were. So there's a logic behind that seven degree value. And the other logic that's important, of course, is that it's based upon um, a very tight time frame because we know that carbon dioxide can linger in the atmosphere for a century, for even more centuries. And so once we burn it, we've, we've committed ourselves to a century of that staying in the atmosphere or more, much more in fact, for some, for, for some forms. <clears throat> so for the 1.5 degrees, we only have a 50-50 chance of avoiding it if we stop that burn in the next 10 years, if we solve the problem. Uh, and, and in case of two degrees, we only have a 50-50 chance of stopping it in the next three decades. So we have therefore to think carefully in terms of the remaining carbon budget, what's left for us to use up. And in that context, you know, there are some very positive actions taking place. I mean, Europe as a whole has reduced its um, EU emission, its carbon emissions by around 20% since 1990. It's not enough, but it's progress. Ireland, on the other hand, has been increasing its carbon emissions. Um, we're higher than we were in 1990, but we've been increasing it quite significantly in the past decades since we started to recover from the, uh, from the great uh, crash of 2009-2010. So as a consequence, we are therefore not um, meeting the obligations that we signed up to in Europe um, 10 years ago. This green line is the glide path we're supposed to be on. The top of the histograms here are where we actually are. And therefore, we, we are, in a sense, out of line with the rest of Europe and many parts of the world. And we face issues in terms of compliance for our 2020 targets. So um, even if we were not to talk about 7%, we already are facing difficulties as Europe's laggard, one of the worst to performing countries in Europe. You can see here we're number 41 in the league table. Um, so we're not doing not delivering the goods we promised. <clears throat> so we therefore are going to have to come to terms with the fact that we're going to have to change quite radically our approach to emissions. And even later this year, we know that the EU Commission <clears throat> in its latest round of pledges under Paris um, will offer a plan to reduce its emissions by between 50 and 55% in the next 10 years. So this is something that is down the line for us that we know we're going to have to comply with. And indeed, the, the Joint Oireachtas Committee has already accepted this, has accepted the emissions gap report, has accepted the need for a 7.0 at least percent reduction in our emissions. So it's not a party political issue. This is an all party uh, conclusion that has been reached. So quite a lot of things are happening. <clears throat> Maybe I should stop there and come back later on, uh, Saiv, if you want to, to cover something else later on. Have you, have you gone? Yeah, I haven't. Sorry, I had just <laughs> muted myself there. Um, thank you so much, John. As ever, uh, an incredible tour de force through the science and <clears throat> policy evolution um, uh, to the point where we're at now. I think it might be interesting to ask you about how credible the Climate Action Plan was <laughs> and what the difference is between the measures that are proposed in that plan and this sort of idea now of a 7% target, so what that would look like. And the other question I was going to ask you is if you can just explain the different role that different gases play in contributing to global warming, <coughs> and because of Ireland's unique emissions profile, what you think about having a separate target for methane other than something different other than 7% uh, reduction, if, if you think that would be a good idea yeah. or a bad idea? 
Okay, well, and firstly, in terms of the, the Climate Action Plan, um, it was a good first step. Um, it did offer quite an interesting set of administrative and organisational uh, reforms, which I think were badly needed. Um, it it recognised the, um, the, the carbon budget issue. It recognised the need for the Taoiseach to uh, take control of the process as the only person who could bang heads together among dissident departments. It strengthened the Climate Action Council and the Oireachtas Committee. And it, it made the government think about investments and about legislation. All of these things were part of the original intention of the 2013 Act, which uh, I know some of us were involved in, but at least that's a very positive thing. But when it comes to uh, actually drilling into it, then you find that the implied uh, emission rate reduction, if everything worked perfectly, was really too low. It was only about 2% per annum in the early years, at least. So it relied an awful lot on a, an economics perspective on everything, a marginal abatement cost curves, which kind of implied that we wouldn't do this if it cost us more than the benefits in the short term. And so it didn't really go far enough. Um, it didn't really tackle um, um, a, a, a lot of the things that we needed to tackle. So, for example, um, there were some ambitious things in it, like a lot more wind turbines, a lot more EVs, <clears throat> bans on petrol diesel vehicles and retrofits and heat pumps. All of these things have to happen and they have to happen quickly. But we actually need a little more. And we need also to think a little more about um, <clears throat> the gases uh, that, that are causing this problem because Yes, um, we, we are all very familiar with carbon dioxide, but also, of course, with methane, which is our major contribution in many ways uh, to not solving our problem. And <clears throat> there are moves at the moment to, to measure methane and to separate it out from carbon dioxide um, measurements because it's, it's currently wrapped up in a global warming potential figure which doesn't do justice in some ways to the toxicity of methane as a greenhouse gas. So alternative ways of measuring it, yes, would be fine, but they would not in any way be a get out of jail free card for Ireland because uh, implicit in those other forms of measurement is the need to reduce methane quickly in the short term. And that's why, you know, the, the kind of uh, stuff you hear coming out in some of the tabloid press about how methane is not Good, not bad for climate, the kind of stuff you hear from mavericks that are brought over from the States to talk about methane, uh, it's very misplaced indeed. And methane, no matter how you measure it, has to come down quickly and has to come down in the short term. Whether you gross it up with CO2 or not, it is the thing which will give us the biggest bang for our buck in the next decade or so. So that's, that's the gases. Let me yeah, maybe I'll stop there and we can talk a little maybe later about what things 7% might imply in terms of reductions, if you like, uh, Sive, rather than go into them all at the moment. Thank you, John. Just, uh, just touching on something that I mentioned in the introduction, how much of a reduction in emissions can we expect for 2020? And will this lockdown make a difference to, you know, whether or not Ireland can meet 2030 targets as they stand at the moment? Well, the International um, Energy Agency have today estimated a, a reduction likely of around 8%. Um, maybe 8 to 11 percent, um, even on a global scale. And um, I think we can expect something between 5 and 8 percent in Ireland uh, next year. Or in, we won't know until, of course, 2021, the end of 2021, um, how we did this year, because the, there's a very long lag on, on greenhouse gas data. But I think, um, you know, we have to remember that um, some parts of the economy are still functioning almost as normal. Uh, the agricultural e economy is continuing as of normal. Um, 
our household consumption pattern may well be in fact up, if anything, due to increased electricity and heating demand. Um, so it's really just transport and commerce that are going to be the major uh, drags, if you like, and they're going to reduce our emissions. Um, I don't think we will um, get out of jail free uh, on the basis of one year's estimates. However, um, I, I think we are already exceeding our annual value since 2016, and we should have been taking measures to um, to rectify that uh, in 2017, 18, 19 and 20, which we haven't really shown uh, evidence of doing. So um, although 2021 may turn out to be a reduction of five or six percent, it won't be anything like the 20 percent that we need for uh, compliance with the with the sign up we made in 2008. It's worth remembering in 2008 when when the EU signed up to these deals that um, the Irish government and, and Irish politicians in Europe um, were very supportive. Um, they claimed in some cases, a major party claimed it didn't go far enough. The European People's Party thought it was a terrific day's work. Um, so, you know, we, we, we didn't get a deal which was against our wishes in any shape or form at that stage. Our Council of Ministers signed up to it. It's, it's not, um, I think there's no point in being revisionist about it at this stage and claiming that we got a bad deal because we willingly signed up at that stage. So it's up to us to comply with that. And of course, we haven't done that. Thank you so much, uh, John. We might we might switch over to Carla now. Uh, I don't know if you can retire your slides temporarily for a moment. So we'll be able to. So Cara, I was just going to come to you and ask you for any comments you might have on some of the things that John mentioned there about where you think this 7% figure now stands in the political context and how important it is to ensure that the next programme for government delivers on the kinds of things that John has been speaking about there. Yeah, for, first of all, just to say that I've seen John present uh, climate science presentations, I've probably seen about 100 of them at this stage, and I never get tired of hearing him talk, and he always brings new information to the table. So I found that really interesting myself. Um, I have to say, a part of me is really um, happy that we are talking about 7% right now, because I remember when the Extinction Rebellion was demanding uh, these kind of ambitious targets, and they they seem so unrealistic and, and out of touch with where we were politically. And yet now here we are where this is this is possibly a reality and it's on the table, you know, to, to kind of an extent of what what XR were were demanding at the time, and some good analysis is coming out uh, on the feasibility. I think it's unfortunate that it's it's still kind of being left to the Green Party to come up with the how, when in reality every political party signed on to the One Future commitment to do this uh, in the general. <coughs> All, they all said they were willing to look at this. So really, they should all have plans put forward on how they're going to do this. But um, I, I saw some analysis just this week by Paul Dean out of UCC. I think it was quoted in the Irish Times too, just talking about how, how can we achieve 7%? Is it realistic? So if you think about the fact that we have about 60 million tons a year emitted in Ireland annually, 7% of that would be would be just over 4 million tons. And he put some numbers on some of the things we could do. And it, and it does show you how difficult it is. So, so if we got all data centers to switch to fully renewable energy in Ireland, we could save 1 million tons. And that's probably like the biggest, biggest thing we could do. But if we just talk about remote working with which John sort of alluded to, the most we could save by the kind of remote working that we're doing right now is 0 0.3 million tons. This is based on um, UCC analysis. So that's five, uh, sorry, half a percent of our annual emissions if we look at remote working. So, so this idea, once again, that it's all based on the individual making changes to their lifestyle, uh, it shows you that those individual changes really don't, they aren't enough, particularly if, as John alluded to, all of the energy that we're using for this remote work and for working from home is coming from fossil fuels. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of tough questions to ask. And I think, I mean, 2% was going to be really difficult. As John said, a lot of the climate climate action plan was dependent on consumers going out and replacing all of their petrol vehicles with electric vehicles. 
probably not very realistic, very expensive too. Um, so that two or 3% reduction that Fine Gael had already committed to, it was difficult to see how they were going to attain that. So now to, to be talking about 7% yet again is difficult and, and we can't afford to be creating these targets on ele you know, electric vehicle purchases and things that just aren't going to happen. They have to be targets that are aligned with policies that are, that are realistic. And it's very hard to see where that's coming from. I mean, even Paul Dean mentioned in his analysis that the current climate action plan has a has an expectation of retrofitting 250 homes per day to uh, a energy rated standards we don't have the the uh, labor and the skills to be able to do that so so to to increase that level of energy retrofit as is going to be required to hit seven percent without the expertise to do it without the labor to do it is very hard to see how that can be achieved Thank you so much, Cara. That's really, really interesting. And um, I, it certainly sets up the kind of challenges that the next government are going to be faced with. So imagine that you're the advisor to the next incoming government. What's the first thing you think they should do? Wow, uh, tough question. I, I think that, that uh, definitely the one strength of the Climate Action Plan was uh, the governance. And the reason that to date, we or one of the reasons we we have failed to meet our emission reduction targets that we've signed on to in Europe is because we've never had this discussion on what the obligation uh, of each sector is. So we've kept kicking that can down the road um, and, and never really put the burden on any specific sectors. Um, we've had these overall targets, except for, I guess, in the case of energy, which has been a relatively good news story compared to the other sectors. So I think getting that uh, climate legislation that they've committed to and those five-year carbon budgets in each sector legislated within the first 100 days of government is going to be key to, to getting the ball rolling. And it's good to see that that's, that's been a commitment uh, between Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael in response to the Green Party's letter, um, that they would do that. But I think that would really, um, that would be a game changer for all the sectors that they would have to finally be accountable for their emissions. That's great. And what measures would you take, say, in the transport sector? We've talked a little bit about energy, and I see that David Connolly has just posted in the chat box there that the uh, Irish Wind Energy Association has, if, if I'm understanding his message correctly, published its own kind of map of how the 7% would be achieved. Um, but if we, if we move away a little bit, not, not, sorry, not the IWEA, David Connolly's own chart. Um, so there are different ways to get to the target, but what uh, contribution do you think that transport could make given our uniquely car dependent society in Ireland? Yeah, well, it's troubled me that all the plans thus far put forward on transport have been completely focused on electric vehicles. And um, I think that's been a misguided focus. So uh, certainly the emphasis has to be on public transport and on sustainable and active uh, infrastructure. And there was commitments, I think Fine Gael's manifesto had committed to a two to one ratio of funding uh, uh, public transport over, over roads uh, in their manifesto. And and they've reiterated that commitment in their in their response to the Green Party's request. Um, so hopefully we would start to see more of that um, and, and less of this emphasis on electric vehicles. And I think actually um, the Irish Wind Energy uh, Agency that Dave Conley is part of has also um, recently set up a or help set up a, 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 a association looking at storage of energy too. And I think that's gonna be the next big component to look at how we can store intermittent renewable energy, um, maybe using hydrogen or batteries or whatever technology is available uh, to do that so that we can really ramp up the renewable energy sector. And this comes to another point, which is really when we're talking about mapping out a future to, uh, to uh, net zero emissions, because regardless of where, what date we pick for that end goal, that has to be the goal. That's what the IPC science is telling us that we must achieve. Um, who should be advising us? How should that kind of relationship between scientific expertise and political decision making, how should that evolve? And is there anything we can learn from the COVID crisis about how we should model public policy in these times of crisis? Yeah. So John alluded, I think, to the, the fact that the um, advice is always coming out, it's very economic. And I think the reason for that is our climate change advisory 
Council is filled with economists. Uh, I think there's a little bit of social science in there, but there's actually no scientists on the Climate Change Advisory Council. And uh, where I see this becoming uh, a big problem is that uh, that what's happening, I believe, is that they're looking at this in terms of a silo view, which is we have a task of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and how are we going to achieve that task in the most cost effective way possible. And in the process, they're ignoring the fact that we have also declared a biodiversity crisis in Ireland. And we were the first country in the world to declare a biodiversity crisis, but that's happening globally. Uh, we've lost 25% of the world's insects since 1990. That was just reported uh, this week from a very comprehensive German study. So this biodiversity crisis is exacerbated by the climate crisis, uh, but it's also happening because of land use change and, and other issues. And we're focused, our Climate Change Advisory Council is purely focused on emissions reductions. And uh, one of the ways that that's exacerbating the biodiversity crisis is that a big solution uh, being put forward is afforestation. So planting more trees in Ireland, that's a great thing in theory. Uh, but when we focus primarily on monoculture, conifer forests, uh, that has a negative impact on, bio on biodiversity, which Birdwatch Ireland has, has uh, provided evidence for. So if we don't have scientists on the Claim Climate Change Advisory Council, then we run this risk of, of creating other environmental problems. And we saw something similar when we changed the motor tax uh, uh, rates so that diesel vehicles were favored because we thought that they were better from a climate change point of view. And now it turns out uh, they're, they're worse from an air, air pollution, air quality point of view. So it's really important to look at these issues uh, holistically and, and not see them in silos. Like if we fix the coronavirus, uh, we may cause all these other problems uh, in the process. So we have to look at everything um, in, a, in a more holistic view so that we don't cause other problems. Thanks so much, Cara. And I, I should have introduced Cara by saying, although she's well known to many of us, that uh, Cara is a lecturer in um, environmental politics at UCD and also is a broadcaster with News Talk and regularly features um, with Ivan Yates on his show there. So um, and that, that was making me think actually of the way we tend to think about climate policy as being a very top down process. So we, we have been arguing ourselves for government leadership and for science based policy. But there's another dimension to all of this, which is a more bottom up approach. And I wanted to come to you, Kate, and ask you about what you think the potential is for engaging communities in this uh, new type of energy democracy that we are hoping will um, flourish uh, in the context of climate action. Thanks, Beth. Um, well, I suppose I'll start by saying um, an energy democracy or citizens and communities engaging with energy is it's actually starting to become a more popular concept, but it has actually been around for a very long time. And almost all of the first renewable energy projects were built by citizens and communities coming together. A lot, we saw a lot of them in Germany and Denmark when people were just trying to find ways of powering themselves with different um, technologies, particularly around when the oil crash happened in the 70s. Um, but more and more people and communities are trying to get involved in this energy transition and it works a lot better when people are involved because often we find the benefits of renewable energy are shared and they often also bring along a lot of other benefits in addition to just the carbon emissions reduction sort of societal benefits so there's often a focus on retrofitting people's homes so that they're living in more comfortable warmer homes that are healthier and um, reducing people's bills and addressing fuel poverty so there are lots of other societal benefits in addition to renewable energy and reducing carbon emissions. Um, Ireland, unfortunately, is really behind um, and it's been blocked quite a lot just by policy. So we have great, excellent, we know we have excellent renewable energy resources here in Ireland um, and we have excellent wind resources and we've focused very heavily on the wind, but we also have other resources that people and communities can engage with, um, like owning parts of wind farms, bringing on and owning solar farms, having solar on rooftops on schools, you know, bringing renewable energy into our communities and then being able to share it among our communities in a kind of more local way. And that's another where, place where Ireland is really behind. Um, at the moment, there is no opportunity for individuals to sell or share energy with, with their neighbours or in their, in their smaller local areas because we have legislation that prevents it. Um, and that's very prohibitive. So I think there's a long way to go in this space, but it does 
have great opportunities. And I'm pleased to see in the previous government, there was kind of a general understanding that if we want to move to a more sustainable and fossil free energy system, that we do have to get people involved in that. And there are really, really good benefits to doing so. So there's some moves to make changes in that, but really none fast enough. And there was a lot of talk, really a lot of talk, but very little action. Um, even, even within the Climate Action Plan, there were certain things that were supposed to happen by the end of last year, like removing planning permission. One of the things I'm struggling with is um, putting solar panels on schools and you know you need to get planning permission for that, even just for one solar panel, which is kind of a mad thing. And uh, it was supposed to be removed by the last government at the end of last year, but it wasn't. And introducing ways for small generators to get paid and connecting to the grid easier was supposed to be changed to the end of last year and it wasn't at all. So there's a long way to go in it, but it does offer huge potential benefits. You're on. You. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, I, I think that's a really important aspect of, of, of the transition because um, one of the things that we're going to need to have is public buy-in. Um, people have to feel that they're invested in this future and that it's not all about higher taxes or increased costs in terms of energy prices or fuel prices or being required to invest in expensive new cars or retrofitting that kind of messes up your house for months on end. Um, and the energy, the energy potential at, at micro level for people to generate small amounts of energy so they can become more self-sufficient and then sell any surplus back to the grid is not just a critical way of adding more renewable energy back onto the grid. It's also a way of adding people into the climate solutions. And if we don't tap into that potential resource, uh, we're at risk of missing out on bringing people along with us and um, sort of transforming the way we think about energy and using energy because when you start generating your own energy the evidence is that people start being a lot more careful and they switch on their washing machines and charge up their EVs when they know they're actually generating surplus solar electricity. So it can change behavior and it can benefit uh, the householder and the consumer in ways that are uh, beneficial to society as a whole. Um, Anya is suggesting that we might switch over to the q &A A's that have come through and thank you so much for putting those questions in but just before we do that do you want to come back on anything John uh, anything that you didn't get to mention that you want to say now you have to unmute yourself Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I think we have to think uh, about what we can do in the immediate future because we're talking about a very quick reduction over a very short time period. So all of the things that we've been talking about need to be done. But if we think about, say, the next year or two, um, then I think that's that's opening up a whole new sort of raft of things that we have to do. Um, I'm just trying to figure out whether I can share. My, yeah, I can share my screen here, uh, I think. We can um, see it actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll go to slideshow. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you think about um, things that we really have to do quickly, um, then there's a whole raft of possibilities here uh, that we might think about. Um, so I think the first thing we have to do is stop fossil fuel subsidies in the short term. Uh, we have to start thinking about uh, stopping uh, fossil fuel powered cars and yes i know the ev problem is a big challenge but until you incentivize people to make that transition it won't happen so i think we need to bring forward our 2030 target for for new cars um, fossil fuel cars being banned in Ireland. It's 2030 at the moment, but other countries in Europe are doing it much quicker. We do have to look at the national herd. There's no way out of this. Uh, and I don't think we're talking about culling the herd. We simply could stop artificial insemination for a year or two and continue to, uh, if you like, retire out the older um, members of, of the herd. This would not be cruel in any way, uh, any more than it is at the moment. We need to look at the way in which the common agricultural policy rewards farmers and gives them a just living for the food they produce uh, and for the stewardship of the landscape that they have because they're a very valued and very important segment of society. 
then we do need to use the stick. We need to start penalizing people who are not paying the full pollution cost. So I think we have to make, um, you know, the, the, the gas guzzler SUV, uh, something that's a real luxury for very wealthy people and use the extra revenue for driving more sustainable forms of transport. And then the thing we have been touching around here, the modal shift, the modal shift to public transport, the modal shift to biking and to walking um, and, and especially I think to discouragement <clears throat> of cars coming into our city centres uh, on a daily basis. So let's stop subsidising car parks uh, in the city centre um, by way of benefit in kind, by way of enabling companies to have free car parking in their basement. We need a just transmission, transition of course, but what about things like VAT and fertiliser? We're the only country in the EU that doesn't have that. What about banning uh, private parking, as I've said, increasing electrification, expansion? These are more long-term, aren't they? But nevertheless, um, we can do small things like school runs better. We can do offshore wind connections more quickly. Um, David is probably uh, champing at the bit there, David, at the moment, David Connolly, because he's probably frustrated at the speed with which um, you can't get permission uh, to to get offshore wind. We need to look at building regs as well um, and be much more strict about the new kind of buildings we're constructing around the country. All of these are short term in a way, but they're things we have to do now and they're things which should be on the agenda for, um, for the department to try and enforce a uh, 7% over the next couple of years at least. Great. Let's see. Um, Okay, we have um, about 48, 49, 50 questions. So I won't be able to uh, go to them all. Had you picked out any uh, audio that you <coughs> wanted to start with? Yeah, so I've been trawling through the questions in the last while and some of them are really, really interesting. I've tried to kind of um, put them together uh, theme-wise. Um, so hopefully um, most people will get some form of answer to their questions. And I've also seen as we've gone along some of the questions that people were answering at the start um, hopefully have been answered uh, by Cara and John. Um, so I suppose uh, the first big question um, that a lot of people have been touching on is this idea of just transition. Um, and uh, John, uh, you just touched on that a second ago, but I suppose there's, a que there's questions around just transition for workers. There's also questions around um, just transition for people across the country and, and also there's been some, a few questions about things like uh, what, happens, what happens next, how do we rebuild after, after COVID, how do we achieve um, reduction, emissions reductions targets in a fair way, so how is there a just transition um, for, for everyone after that and I realise that's, that's a very broad question so if you want to answer that kind of just transition question in whatever uh, broad or niche way you'd like to could I, could I put that question to you, Kate, actually, because you've been involved in the One Future campaign and the discussions that we have been having, those of us in Stop Climate Chaos and Friends of the Earth, also with other civil society partners. You're mute. <laughs> I also was um, focused on trying to get an answer out to a question, so I didn't actually hear what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think side you, you you might be able okay. to Okay, no no no, I'll do it as well. I'm really sorry. Right there, but that's yeah. okay. Well I'll just say quickly that in advance of the election we we in Stop Climate Chaos and Friends of the Earth uh, had been involved in discussions with other uh, civil society organizations in the lead up to the general election. And the idea was to um, keep those discussions going uh, to try to come up with some sort of common flat platform for a Green New Deal. So on the one one hand, just transition is about making sure that workers in industries that are going to be effectively shut down, where you have concentrated job losses uh, due to the closure of the likes of the peat stations or Money Point, have a viable future, a pathway to reskilling, upskilling, and uh, income support and new pathways to employment. And also, the bigger picture, which is really a different model for making the whole of certain sectors transition towards uh, climate friendly, climate neutrality. And that's going to involve um, some very difficult decisions that, that will affect the labour market over time. So it's important that we have these discussions in step with the trade unions. But in addition to that, there's been a lot happening in the last few weeks in the context of the COVID crisis, looking at 
what does an essential service mean? There was a time when we, we tended to think of bankers as being the essential workers in society, but now with the context of this public health crisis, we can see that it's healthcare workers, it's people who uh, are collecting rubbish, uh, people who are um, involved in providing caring services in society, if you like, and keeping those parts of our economy that we often don't even pay attention to functioning in a time of crisis. So our understanding of an essential service and how the income supports could work in the context of a very different economic model, suddenly we have lots of possibilities that we never thought we would see. So Green New Deal and a post-COVID just recovery are things that we are in dialogue with other civil society actors about very much at the moment and those discussions will continue. Cara, did you want to come in on that? I almost want to kind of respond with a question because um, Sive and John and I all analyzed all of the uh, the political party manifestos leading up to the general election, the last general election, and one of the categories that we, we rated them on was just transition. And my own feeling was, I mean, Sive, I think you explained what a just transition is beautifully. Um, my impression is nobody's got a plan yet. I mean, the, the most progress we've made is that a just transitioner was recently appointed, a just transition commissioner was recently appointed by uh, the last government. I haven't heard anything from him. I don't know if maybe you guys have. Um, and I didn't think any of the manifestos that I read really, they kind of mention the word. It's become a nice little buzzword that shows you care. Um, but I don't, I haven't seen any tangible plans. Great. Uh, it, 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 the commissioner um, is in place and has access to a budget, but the budget is very much focused on the Midlands and it is, is not clear if it can be replicated easily to other areas and also his powers are kind of limited. He hasn't got the power to negotiate with trade unions as such directly, but rather um, kind of facilitate uh, the work of existing agencies on the ground. Nonetheless, I think there are some, there are going to be some interesting lessons to be learned from that, but hopefully we'll be able to scale them up quickly because as we know, it's all very urgent indeed. Anya, do you want to throw out another question? Yes, absolutely. So there's two kind of big themes as well that are coming up. Um, one is around aviation and one is around methane. And I know we've touched on methane a little bit, um, but a couple of people have asked about there's a, a Irish Farmers Association, IFA, um, campaign at the moment um, with a scientist, and I'm going to probably butcher his name, Frank Mitloner. Um, and, and someone's saying Frank is, Mitloner is giving a very, very clear, simple message about methane. Um, and it's difficult to argue with his message without getting bogged down in the science. So um, is there a way of communicating about methane um, in a simple way? Um, and then the second question is around aviation. So a lot of people are just asking, what about aviation? Is there anything about aviation? Um, and I know that a lot of the conversations around post-COVID uh, recovery, a lot of those questions around aviation are coming up because obviously at the moment, uh, lots of the flights are grounded. Um, so does anyone want to, to come in on either of those topics? Um, well, I'll come in on the first one. Um, the importing of uh, people from North America with a very, uh, I sh shall I say, individualistic view of the science um, is not something I'm too concerned about. Um, uh, the individual concerned is not one whose views would be respected over much of the scientific community on this topic. And I think even within his own institution, um, his views are not agreed. Uh, all that matters really is the, the way in which we measure methane for the purposes of the Paris Agreement or for the purposes of the NDC. And, and that's uh, something which um, will not uh, change radically in my view in the short term. We may adopt a slightly different way of measuring methane because of course it is a gas with a shorter lifetime. But if we want to measure it over a shorter lifetime, instead of lumping it in with a hundred year global warming potential of 28, if we want to measure it over 20 years, it has a global warming potential of 85. So, I mean, that is the alternative way of, of thinking about methane and it doesn't really help um, the, the debate very much to, to try and pretend that there's a uh, get out of jail free card in methane in any shape or form. Uh, as regards aviation, <clears throat> well, 
I think this is one of the lessons we have to learn from the lockdown, that as we recover, as we go back to some semblance of normality, it's very important that we don't simply get back on the escalator by subsidising the, the, the industries that have caused the problems in terms of climate. So I think we have to, I don't, don't think society would be very keen on going back anyway. I, I think we have to start thinking about frequent flyer taxes, not frequent flyer cards. I think we have to think about the end of the 10 euro flight. Uh, I think we have to think seriously about aviation paying its way. It won't make a big difference domestically in Ireland. It's a small contribution, um, but over the whole globe, it, it's a growing contribution of concern. So I think it is something that we have to look at very seriously, just as we, we do with marine emissions in terms of trying to bring them into the, the, the net of the Paris Agreement also. Thank you. Uh, Anya, can I just jump in there? Because one of the questions that's come up uh, from Christor is about the potential sequestration from actions like rewetting the bogs and afforestation. And I know that Cara touched on it a little bit already about the fact that our forestry model is not sustainable. Um, but it is, it's a, it's a very important one because re-wetting could actually draw down very significant amount of carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, do you want to comment on that, John? Yes, um, we have studiously avoided counting our emissions from degraded boglands um, for the past 10 years, uh, whereas other countries did count them as part of their emissions inventory. And now effectively we are being forced to count them from 2026. Um, but it means that for the next five years, all the rewetting of bogs, we will not get any credit for. Um, so it is something that's vital. It's something we should be doing anyway. But it's only at the end, at the middle to the end of this decade, that we will be able to claim uh, effective credit for them. Thank you. Uh, Audia, do you want to pick out another question? Um, did, uh, Cara, did you want to come in? or did... Yeah, I, I think John talked about the aviation thing quite well, so I don't want to repeat what he said, but I, I will say one thing that I think everybody listening should know, and that is um, my big concern right now is we are going to bail out a lot of industries at the end of this pandemic, and I think aviation will be one of them because they, they said early on in all of this that they would be bankrupt in May uh, if this continued. Um, so now is a really important time to contact your uh, elected representatives and say to them that any bailout money that's coming from taxpayers uh, should be attached to sustainability measures. And while I'm not saying, you know, now is the time to completely wipe out aviation because every, every industry deserves a just transition, um, I do think that any bailout money should be attached to some kind of um, in indicators of plans to reduce emissions in that sector. And I think we now need to start putting uh, pressure on our politicians to do that because I'm, I, I've already heard that the other side, the likes of the coal industry in America and everything, are already putting pressure on elected representatives to try and uh, you know, get out of envir environmental regulations and get out of paying uh, paying their workers for health related problems as a result of the pandemic. Um, so, so the pressure needs to come from the sustainability sector and side too. Yeah, can I endorse that as well? Because during the crash of 2010 in the United States, uh, President Obama um, bailed out the auto industry. But when he bailed them out, he made conditions in terms of um, improvements in energy efficiency and emission efficiencies, which benefited the whole world uh, in the long run. And that's the kind of model I would like to see um, applied also to aviation. Um, and, and I think there are opportunities there to to push the technology faster in terms of, of aviation fuel and aviation powering, especially for short haul flights, where the, the, the day of the electric plane is not that far away, I believe. Okay, great, thanks so much. Um, we're just gonna have one more question. Um, and uh, then I'm just gonna do a little uh, closing section. Um, and I'm sorry if I, we haven't got to your question, there's been just, over 60 questions. So hopefully some, most of what people have asked have been covered. Um, this is a bit more of a, we're kind of moving a little bit away from the, the targeted, you know, very like what are the targets? But I think it's an interesting question 
about um, Bobby's asked uh, that the current narrative in Ireland and especially the current narrative in the media over the last few days has been um, this is going to be negative, it's going to cause a lot of pain, it's going to cause sacrifice, it's going to be difficult. Um, and how do we harness all sections of society in a positive positive way. Um, other people in the chat have been commenting about uh, community dialogue and um, how it's important for everyone to be on board together. Um, so, so do you guys have any comments on, on turning this into a more, a more positive uh, narrative? Yeah. Um, so. I might just say one thing, which is that I think that we need scientific bodies and the advisory council to explain very clearly to the public in the way that our medical uh, experts have been doing this this the question of what's at stake here we're not just talking about abstractions and we're not just talking about things that are very far away we're talking about uh, lives that will be put at risk from heat stress from uh, flooding from extreme weather events and and that it's going to hit home in ireland uh, that this is a very real threat that we're facing. But even if it was a further away threat in time terms, we need to communicate much more clearly to the public that it's in our collective interest to address these problems fundamentally. Nobody wants traffic congestion anyway. Nobody wants benefits from air pollution. Nobody benefits from polluted water. So we have everything to gain by focusing on climate actions that deliver tangible public benefits and meaningful access to affordable public services like cheap, and somebody pointed out, not diesel public transport, but ideally electric buses. Uh, who's against cycle lanes? Who's against being able to walk safely to school? These are all things that are within our grasp if we choose to take this moment and this opportunity, harness that public will and turn it into climate actions that people can see on the ground make a difference in their personal lives. Uh, but I think that would be very important to building that public will, that it's not perceived as a set of costs, it's not perceived as being sort of targeted at individual sectors, but something that brings us all along together. And there's no question but that it's this experience of this pandemic and the way that we have all been so, um, you know, uh, patient, essentially, and trusting of our scientific uh, experts, and that we are doing what we're told, because we see that it's in the collective interest. And we need to tap into that kind of experience of goodwill and social solidarity, and build our climate actions around that. So I was just going to leave that thought, because somebody asked a lovely question there about how we use this crisis, or not to use the crisis, but turn this crisis into uh, uh, lessons that we can take into the climate debate. And I just wanted to touch on that, but... Um... So, so I, maybe I could add to mm. what you said briefly. Um, I mean, the, the current death toll from uh, coronavirus is about 207,000. It may well get to a quarter of a million, but we're, ve we're listening very carefully to what the World Health Organization is saying at the moment through our experts, through our medical people. If we go onto their website, we will also see that the World Health Organization estimate that between 2030 and 2050, a quarter of a million people will die each year from the effects, direct and indirect, of climate change. And that's a message I think that we can take from the current virus problem that, you know, whatever, it, how bad it is now, if we don't get our act together, the World Health Organization are telling us that it's a dress rehearsal. Cara, do you want to come in there? Uh, yeah, I will. Uh, David Roberts is a is a climate journalist. I, I read a lot. Uh, he posted an article in Vox, which I refer to in a blog I wrote for Friends of the Earth a few weeks ago. And, and in it, he talks about how the Green New Deal that's been proposed in the U.S. could provide a, a roadmap for a post-COVID recovery um, and how all of the things that, that were needed in the Green New Deal, new infrastructure and things, would create new jobs uh, that, that they're going to need in this kind of economic recession and depression that they're that they're facing into and coming from America where we learned about American history and didn't really learn about the rest of the world um, Roosevelt did the same thing in America with the Great Depression he created the Civilian Conservation Corps to take all these laborers who were out of work and he had them building trails in the national parks and the national parks in the United States are now like the crown jewel of the US um, you know super popular and, and preserved and, and lots of people go visit them and all these jobs were created Created to, to sustain these people through this depression. Um, all climate action at the end of the day is local. In Ireland, a lot of the things we need to do 
for climate action actually will need to be done in rural Ireland. Um, Bioenergy, renewable energy, uh, horticulture, afforestation, all need to happen in, in rural parts of Ireland. So these are huge sources of employment if the government is willing to invest and and have a long-term vision. And I actually think, I, I, for a while I thought how unfortunate that we're in the middle of government negotiations during a pandemic. But I actually now think how lucky we are, we're in govern, government negotiations because here are these green issues are, are being brought to the table at this exact moment. So it's, it's, it's like the best time ever to, for the Green Party to be in negotiations and, and I think in government uh, at a moment when we're going to start to be able to envision a new Ireland, you know, post-COVID, post-pandemic, and we need people at the table who can put sustainability at the forefront of that new vision. Okay, um, thank you so much everyone and, and specifically I also really want to thank all the people who are attending this webinar who have been posting in the chat, having conversations in the chat, sharing articles. There are a huge amount of very experienced, very expert people um, on this webinar so thank you so much for all the expertise you're also sharing there um, and the conversations you're having. Um, a couple of just a couple of things and um, a lot of people ask about government subsidies to fossil fuel companies and um, friends of the earth actually released a, a report um, a couple of weeks ago on irish government fossil fuel uh, subsidies for fossil fuel companies so you can check that out um, on their website um, and just before we finish i think a key thing that we've touched on so much here is the fact that what what we've been asking for we were asking in the election for at least eight percent um emissions reductions on average uh, over the next five years on year on year um, and, and we've been asking for that to be to be fair and fast and so we're talking about seven percent today because it's the it's the number that's in the news but but as, as climate activists and um, we know that we can we can always push for more but it is amazing to see that that we're having these conversations as Cara said at the start about about seven percent now um, but but what's crucial is always talking about fairness so how do we do this in a fair way that, that benefits as many people as possible. So just before we finish, Cara a few minutes ago touched on the idea of it's so important right now to talk to your politicians and tell them that we want people and planet to be at the center of this recovery um, and that we need our politicians to stick to strong climate action and faster and fairer climate action um, in the next government. So next week, we will we'll be holding another webinar similar to this, but it's actually going to be a briefing for TDs. Um, so we've invited next Wednesday evening, every TD in Ireland to, to come online, to come to a webinar like this, where they'll be briefed on um, what 7% means and these kind of, of topics. Um, but we also want you to come along. So we, want, we have an action up. If you go into stopclimatechaos.ie forward slash take action, um, ideally, you could do it now and then you'd have it done. Um, and what you'll do there is you'll click a link and you'll invite your TD to uh, the webinar next week. So the more people that invite their TDs, the more likely they are to come. And then also you can come on the webinar and what we'll do is we'll break people out into groups so you can actually talk to your TDs yourself um, in your local constituency groups um, and tell them what you actually really want. And so they know that it's really important to you that they put people and planet at the center um, of the recovery. And also it means that you can talk about what's, what's local to you, what's important to you locally. Um, and as we've all been talking about here, um, local action is, is really important as well. Things that feel tangible to local people. So that link is stopclimatechaos.ie forward slash take action. It'll take you two minutes um, and you'll have an email sent to your TD to ask them to register. Um, so if you can do that, that would be great. Um, and then we'll hopefully see you next week where you can actually talk to your TDs yourself um, and tell them what you want. Um, so I'm gonna do a big thank you to John and Kara and Sive and Kate. I don't know, do you guys wanna do a little closing statement? I'll just say one thing, um, Anya, because it just struck me there to say that we, we in Friends of the Earth, we've been holding on um, Stop Climate Chaos, hosting these kind of lobby days with constituents and their TDs every year. And usually we do it in Buzzwell. And it's always a really positive event. And TDs always come and they come because their constituents ask them to come. And we host little meetings between constituents and their TDs. And it's a really great way 
way to actually get to talk to the person who is your elected representative. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been online and getting people to call their TDs and starting those conversations. So this really is just the next step. Um, but I just want everybody to be aware of the power that they hold just by living where they live and having the elected representatives that they have. We have great access to our elected representatives here in Ireland, and we just need to take more advantage advantage of that now more than ever. So I just would implore upon everybody who showed up this evening um, to get in touch with your representative and get them really working hard for forming the next government because we really, really need it to be a good one. Um, so go ahead. And, and can I just add to that, because somebody asked me even today, but what about the parties that might be in opposition? Well, the truth is we don't know who's in opposition yet and who's in government. So no TDs should be excluded from this. You might say, oh, but my, my local TD is Sinn Féin or, you know, they're not in government or they won't be. We don't actually know that. And it's very important that we build up relationships with the opposition, whoever they turn out to be, as much as government parties. So email everybody. <laughs> Great. Cara, John, John, you've unmuted there. Do you want to? Uh, no, just thanks for everything. Uh, the opportunity to talk to people is great. And uh, I hope we got our message across in some shape or form. <laughs> yeah, and Cara? Um, yeah, I'll just say it's been, I've been really watching the little chat there um, and, and all the enthusiasm and energy, even though we can all hang out together. Um, I've been part of those lobbies that Kate mentioned at Buzzwells and they are so exciting and she's right, coming from the States where it's so rare you get to meet your politicians to uh, Ireland where they're so accessible and, and we're so lucky that we can do that. And I'm gonna take part on, on uh, Wednesday next week because it sounds insane and I can't wait to see how this is gonna work. So fair play for organizing something like this. Yeah, and just to come in there, the hope is that John and Carla will be with us again next week. Uh, so this is a kind of uh, the first of a set of two and the second part hopefully will be even bigger. But uh, it's amazing to see so many people turning up today. So thank you for your attendance. Okay, thank you so much to everyone for giving up an hour and 15 minutes out of your evening. Uh, we really appreciate it. We hope that you found it informative um, and there's seems like the rain has stopped and there's a little bit of sunshine out there. So enjoy it and uh, yeah, have a lovely week and hopefully we will chat to you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.